Great. So good evening again. Uh, let me begin with a quick introduction. I'm, I'm Rajiv Vaidya, and I lead Groupant in India and, and ASEAN. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening uh, to this event uh, hosted by Aspen India uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to interview our CEO and Chairman Ellen Kuhlman. Um, and it's a pleasure to have Mr. Tarun Das you know, doing the work with that, with, uh, as the moderator interviewer tonight. No introduction needed for Mr. Tarun Das. Uh, as you know, he is very well known in uh, the Indian industry and now uh, the mentor uh, for CII. Uh, so enjoy the evening, a discussion on innovation and transformation. Uh, ask some questions. And so without further ado, I would invite Ellen and Tarun Das to come up to the stage, please. You can talk about it. Oh, core values. <laughs> core values. I need to have a safety contact with you. Now, if you Absolutely. had tripped, I would have felt so guilty. Oh, my God. I would have been uh, terrible because I would have felt I, like I didn't do my job as host. Or I, Rajiv I, might feel guilty, too, <laughs> yeah. um, to keep you safe. This is great. This is a great CEO. <laughs> Let's give her a big hand. Thank you, thank you for this uh, opportunity to spend time with this great uh, group here in Bombay, the capital of India. You know, all these people feel that this is the capital of India, not Delhi, and uh, well, they have they have something there. All the money is here. That's good. All the money is here. But uh, you have just come now from the snow and ice of Davos, I hear, as have some others who are in the audience. Um, how is the world looking in 2013 from Davos? Davos is an interesting place because everybody goes there to get what everybody else is thinking. <laughs> um, and at the end of the day, over the last three years, ever since the global financial crisis, it's improved but not greatly. So this year was uh, not as pessimistic as last year. The Europeans aren't thinking their, their world's falling apart. So they're thinking that they'll have zero growth, and they felt good about that. Now, I'm not sure who feels good about zero growth, but that <laughs> wouldn't be my definition of, of, of good. Um, so I think it was cautious. cautious. Um, but people wanted to be optimistic, and they were really looking for a reason to be optimistic. And, you know, I think they were searching for it. But, you know, I think they were hoping 13 is a lucky year, not an unlucky year. And is it, uh, is it uh, more depressing? I mean, you've been CEO of DuPont for over five years now. Four years. Four years, fifth year starting. Chair for four years. Mm -hmm. um, you came in as a leader at the worst of times. Is it better now? Well, you know, so first of all, for those of you who lead large organizations, you know you have to be an optimist by nature or you'll, it'll kill you, right? Because there are a lot of tough things you have to do. And I'm an optimist. Um, and I, I think it has gotten better steadily. I think you have to work hard at it. I don't think it's easy because Europe certainly isn't helping from a growth standpoint. Um, even here in India, we had our, I call it a hiccup this year um, with the devaluation and infrastructure, you know, investment wasn't as great as it had been historically. Um, but I think there still are bright spots that, that you can look at. And we always try to look for the bright spots. What are the areas, what industries um, and innovations can match up to really create um, excitement or growth in whatever economic environment is thrown at us, because I can't control the economy, right? Um, but what I can control is what DuPont does during uncertain economic times. And so I like to focus on what we can control and what we can influence, as opposed to worrying, you know, what the currency rate's going to be or things like that. I've got lots of economists and scientists or economists and finance people who worry about exchange rates, and they'll do a great job there. <laughs> 
I don't know how many of you know that DuPont is over 210 years old. Isn't that amazing? I mean, 210 plus years. And we're still here. And you're still here. Yeah. I, there were well, several, I won't there ask. Were several times when we almost weren't. Well, one in particular when we almost I, weren't. I, but, I read about that. Yeah. I read about that. That's amazing. But what an honor to lead that company. It's a humbling yeah. uh, experience. How many employees? Worldwide? Uh, 70,000. 70,000 employees. Yeah. That's amazing. And are you growing in India? How, let me bring the conversation to India. Well, um, we would have grown last year if it weren't for that little currency issue. Um, and so we're making progress in application development um, of products, whether it's in the automotive industry um, or in alternate energy or in nutrition and health with the purchase of Danisco. We now have a food ingredients business, and we have an enzyme business that goes into a lot of different areas, whether it's animal nutrition or um, detergents or a lot of different areas. And agriculture is a bright spot. Um, Indian agriculture is looking for innovation, is looking for not only, you know, it's hybrid seed here for food crops, but also um, agronomic um, um, depth of understanding and the dairy industry, looking at really how we improve that. So agriculture is an exciting place for the DuPont company these days. You mentioned innovation a couple of times. That's serious business for DuPont? It's, it's the only business. It's the only business? It's innovation. It's science. And you have an innovation center in Hyderabad, am I right? We have, uh, well, OK, uh, Homi Bedwar would kill me if I called it an innovation center, because okay. that's in Pune. Okay. Um, the, what's in, it's in um, Hyderabad, it's a research and development center. Okay. We call it the Knowledge Center. Okay. So we do research um, on agriculture. We do a application development in, in Kevlar and Nomex and Corian and all sorts of things, industrial biosciences. And so, um, and he's, I don't know, 50, increasing the size by at least 50%. I'm threatening to show up so I see what he, exactly he's doing. But um, I'm not going to be able to make it this trip. Uh, but it's really exciting. We opened it in 08. Right. And right at the depth, or the, I should say, the depth of the financial crisis, we, we christened it and opened its doors. And it was the best move we've made uh, from the standpoint of localizing our science to the needs of Indian industry. And the Innovation Center is in Pune, and what does that do? Well, an innovation center is a concept that is a virtual um, innovation center. We, it's a physical place, and it has um, a video conferencing capability. It has examples of DuPont innovation in different applications, okay. and this one's specific to the automotive industry, and whether it's lightweighting vehicles or, um, you know, whether it's use of uh, things like Kevlar and Nomex in tough applications okay. underneath the hood. Um, and, but we can connect our customers with our scientists around the world, wherever they live, uh, whether they're in our Shanghai Research Center or in Wilmington, Delaware, or in Paulina, Brazil. If a customer has a problem, we can get the right people on the video conference okay. and really talk about the problem and, and how you know, we should think about it and what we could work on together. So it's a way of connecting our customers to DuPont Science globally. An individual, a person, is resistant to change. And yet, uh, in your uh, different speeches and remarks, which I have I've seen, you've talked a lot about transformation. To me, transformation means change. Mm -hmm. And so how do you drive that? I mean, is the organ such a large organization, is there resistance to change and transformation? Or have you got it into the DNA? How, how does it work? Well, you know, since we only do it every 100 years, um, we have to kind of start over again. And, uh, you know, it, it's hard, right? I mean, people feel very comfortable with what they know. And you have to give them a view to where they're going because you have to make the trip worthwhile. So we're a company. We have a lot of engineers in our company. And so they're very logical beings. Um, and so you have to capture not only their head, but their heart. And if you can capture both, then you can make the journey. And it has to be compelling. Right. And um, so we work at that very hard every day. And it's working? Most days. Most days. 
Well, you know, it's a, you know, it's five steps forward, one step back, two step forward. I mean, so it it comes and goes. And so, like, if you think about um, the transition we made when we bought Danisco, mm -hmm. so the company looked at me and said, "Why do we need that?" And then you start explaining how um, enzymes are the cat are the the catalysts of this century, and how we break down things. Um, whether it's, it's cellulose or, you know, waste and create higher order products is the same thing this company did in the 1900s using petro, you know, chemicals as the base, right? Using petroleum as the base. And so you, you give them a couple of examples like we um, engineered um, an organism to uh, use sugar as its energy source and create something called 1,3-propane diol. It's a monomer that you can then react and make carpet, a polymer that can go into carpet or fiber. You can use the monomer to create de-icing. Um, so think about all the de-icing stuff that goes on airplanes when it gets cold. Probably doesn't happen here a lot, but we got de-iced in, um, right. in, in Zurich coming out of there. And, and so if you have de-icing that's from a natural source, from sugar, as opposed to from a petroleum source, the environmental impact's a lot less. And so what are the opportunities to use biology, marry it with chemi chemistry and chemical engineering to create very different things? And so our chemists in the beginning weren't quite sure because obviously chemistry can solve anything. Um, and once, and they didn't even want to talk to the biologists. Yeah. And, um, and once we got them together, as I say, I locked them in a room and wouldn't let them come out until they had an idea that they agreed on. Um, and they kind of laugh when I say that now, and it was kind of true, because they didn't see the power that each other brought. The biology said, look, we can create things, but they didn't know how to make it at scale, at cost, and in a way that was relevant to our customers, because, you know, you have to make it affordable, right, and scalable. Yeah. And the chemist said, well, why do we need them? And, and you know, it was um, now, you fast forward 10 years, and now they're you know, sitting next to each other, creating their future together. They didn't, they don't remember that 10 years ago, they didn't even want to talk to each other. And so you have to work it, and it takes time. Yeah. Um, but it's worth it, because at the end, you get real innovation, and you get really exciting new ideas that can help our company be relevant to our customers on our 300th birthday. That's great. That's a great story. That's a great story. You mentioned environment. As you, as you were talking about uh, this experience. Um, the buzzword in the world today, all the time, sustainable growth, sustainable growth. Oftentimes, I feel that many people use it just as a slogan. Mm -hmm. um, is it serious for you and for DuPont, sustainable growth? And how do you address that? And you know, how, how do you take that forward? So about 25 years ago, about three CEOs ago, a guy by the name of Ed Woolard um, came under fire as in the 1980s, the chemical industry came under fire um, for its emissions and greenhouse gas and other emissions that were out there. And he renamed himself not chief executive officer, but chief environmental officer and set the company on a course that started with footprint reduction. We measure our air, our water, our land emissions, and we reduce them. And then um, and we get more energy efficient. Um, and between 1990 and 2010, our volumes grew 40%, and our energy consumption decreased by 6%. And that's not pre, I mean, that's total. And we saved billions of dollars. We were that much more productive. But if we hadn't started on that footprint reduction, that energy journey, we would have never done that. Tremendous efficiency. And then you fast forward, and, and Chad Holliday, my predecessor, really started thinking about it differently, started thinking about how you use sustainability from a top line. How can we help our customers, whether it's become safer, uh, more sustainable, whether it's um, by bringing them products that allow them to, to create a car with lighter weight so you get higher fuel economy. 
or uh, take sulfur out of streams of water or air so that industry can meet um, in the United States what the EPA says and other countries what their regulatory body says that their emissions need to be. So use science to help our industry or value chains get more um, sustainable. And it's become part of how we think about the world. You know, 20, 30 years ago, we operated in communities and we had the gates high and closed because um, they didn't know what they didn't need to know what we did. We're, you know, we're good there because we supply employment. Today, you know, we need to be an active participant in that community. We participate in um, uh, volunteerism in the schools or in social service agencies. We have family days on our plant sites so that employees can bring their families and the community can come in and see what we do. And we can be an active and very... Um, um, and, and they want us there, right? We need to be, our communities need to accept us and what we do. And the world's a very different place from a transparency standpoint than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And for us to be successful, we have to change with it. And I'm just, I'm very, um, you know, I've benefited greatly from what my predecessors have done there. And now my job is to take it further. And how can we really help uh, the world, feed the world, you know, in a growing population, bring more nutrition to the world through food ingredients, you know, create alternates to energy so that places, I mean, I was up in the Punjab region when I was here the last time last year visiting farmers. And, you know, solar energy was what they needed, whether it's for irrigation or for their homes because they're not on the grid, uh, you know, a lot of these small and medium hold farmers. And we just need to make that... Um, cost effective, right, without subsidies and without government um, intervention type of thing. And, and I think on, on protecting people um, and the environment as well. So I think there are things that we can do, um, but we have to be part of the answer and we have to do it sustainably because the communities where we operate need to th look at us as a good um, partner with them and their community. This is a, essentially a corporate audience sitting here. And... Uh, there are concerns in India and perhaps elsewhere about the values of the corporate sector. Mm -hmm. you know, they've been under fire recently. They've been under fire recently. They will be under fire, I think, for some time to come. Um, do you think about this? Do you, how do you deal with values? How do you deal with core values? What, what, what does it mean to you and the company? Um, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so... Um, <clears throat> I'm not a lifer at DuPont. I came 25 years ago, and I know for most places that would seem like a lifetime, but I worked for two other companies before I got there. And when I got to DuPont, um, I found it was, it was, it, it literally, the, from the first day I walked in, it was different in respect to core values. And it's not that the other companies I worked for didn't have core values, they did, but at DuPont it was front and center. Here are our core values. They're safety, environmental stewardship, highest ethical standards, and respect for people. There's only four. We expect you to remember them, and we expect you to operate at a very high level regarding them because you represent the DuPont company wherever you go. And in the beginning, I said, okay, yeah, that makes sense, but I'm working in an office. So I go out to a plant site, and I'm walking down a, a, a big set of steps. And I'm not holding the handrail. I'm talking to the person I'm with who is holding the handrail. And a maintenance worker in that plant stopped me coming down those steps and said, ma'am, please hold the handrail. I don't want you injured in my plant. And, I mean, that, I mean it was the first real manifestation of how deeply it's felt in the company. And then as a leader, I have to become not just a respectful participant in it, I have to be committed to it. I go into a plant site, they watch to see if I hold the handrail. And I'm not all that, you know, I'm really not that graceful, so I need to hold the handrail. I trip. Um, and, um, and I need to talk about ethics, and I need to talk about respect for people, um, because if I don't, then they'll take that as a lack of commitment to that area. And I think it has helped us. I think it's helped us in creating partnerships with our customers and vendors. 
along the way. I think it's helped us with um, entering countries. I mean, we're not perfect as a company. No company is. Um, but I think we've got a shot at doing it right because we have um, some, their core values that have been with us for a long time. This isn't, I mean, safety started with the company in the first 15 years we um, were established as a company. We had written safety rules. Um, and so I think that, I, I think that's our, that's us. Business gets a bad rap. I don't think big business is bad, but if you go out and ask the general population, they're not so sure. Between the banks and what's happened in the world, you know, the LIBOR scandal, you know, and people just paint us all with the same paintbrush around that. And I think it's our job to be the voice of um, what values business have and how it really does benefit. I think you've given a great sense of uh, what DuPont is all about and the way you lead it over the last 15, 20 minutes. I think if I can include the audience sure. and some of them in the conversation, because I'm sure there are uh, great people here who'd like to put questions to you. Uh, maybe I'll start. You mentioned enzymes a couple of times. <clears throat> I love so maybe enzymes. I'll start with Nadir Godridge, because I, I could see uh -uh. him taking notes when you were <laughs> talking about enzymes. Nadir, you have a question for Ellen? a lot and we think there are a lot of applications in animal feed because basically we can use uh, less expensive raw materials uh, with the help of enzymes mm -hmm. and we'd like to know what work uh, DuPont is doing in that and you mentioned green energy so I'd also like to know what DuPont is doing in green energy and the fact that you started off as a gunpowder company is that why you find, uh, from the very early days, you put so much emphasis on safety? So I'll, I'll, ask, I'll answer the last <laughs> one first, because that's, that's an easy one. And the answer is yes. Um, we had, um, so gunpowder blows up. And not necessarily when you want it to. And all it takes is a spark. And so you have these big grinding mills, and powered by the river because uh, our original mill is on the Brandywine River and we used the water to turn the mill. It was very energy, if you think about it, it was sustainability ahead of its time. Um, but if you, if you had coins in your pocket or you had a nail holding the sole on your shoe as opposed to a wooden peg, you could walk across and hit a rock and it could start a reaction um, that could blow up part of the plant and it happened. Um, we had a, an event happened, I think it was in the 1820s, um, that killed one-third of our employees. Now, we only had 99 employees at the time, but there were 31 people killed, greatly injuring members of the family, um, and including our founder's wife, because the house was right above the mills. Because if we had a practice of saying if it was safe enough for our employees, and it was safe enough for family. Um, and over the years, lost family members in runaway reactions, especially when we got in nitroglycerin. So safety became a really elemental part of our um, culture from the very beginning. And then that quickly morphed into the people, respect for people, because we uh, gave pensions to widowers um, in a, at, at an un, unheard of in the 1800s. Um, we would educate the children of our employees. And my kids were a little taken back because they go to the grounds and they see the classroom that was kind of on the edge of the grounds. And the people would describe it as, as this is Sunday school. So my kids said, really? The company taught religion? Because Sunday school in America is usually where children get their religious education after they go to their services. And the woman kind of laughed and said, no. That would be reading, writing, and arithmetic is what they learned because kids from 10 years old or 12 years old worked. And they didn't work in the mills necessarily, but they would work in offices and their parents would bring them down to learn how to read, write, and, you know, um, you know, and add and subtract at a very early age. So, so the culture of the company from a very early time was around safety and people. And we you know, added environmental stewardship and, and ethics as time went on. Um, but those are easy, I mean, they're, they're wonderful 
um, consistent uh, force in our company because it, it translates to any culture. Um, it, it's a source of pride for our people uh, because they know if they come, when they come to work every day, they're not going to be asked to do anything that they're not comfortable with, uh, except maybe work hard. Um, and so it's a really, it's a point of pride for our company. Um, and enzymes, I fell in love with enzymes about 12 years ago in our first um, project with Genencore um, in, in that Serona product that I talked about. And I spent a lot of time because I was asked then to figure out how we um, create business value from biotechnology. Um, and whenever your boss asks you a question like that, run. Uh, because it was kind of this question that didn't have an answer because the technology was still so young at the time. And we've, we've evolved since then. And obviously, I came through it fine. But um, the, the power of enzymes to really break down cellular and then, then our ability to reform it. And so the question is, where could you use that? And so we've done it in a variety of, of areas. And then we decided that when the Danisco came up for sale, we really thought that capability belonged with us. There was a lot of synergy from uh, the whole process, from really uh, not only production agriculture and the creation of maybe cellulose to through to value-added products. And so uh, I was talking to Homi Bedwar and Hal Snyder, who are technical leadership here in India and in Asia Pacific, uh, on how we build out the application development side of that in India. Uh, because we see that the first stage is, yet yeah, we can put a salesman in or a marketing person in, and they're very important for us. But to have that application development capability local and really enable us to work with customers on, on a technical scale, um, I think will really accelerate um, what we're doing here. So uh, they're, they're looking to me for money, and I'm looking for them for creation of business value, and we're, we're, we're going to figure that out real quick. Uh, but I really believe that there's a tr that enzymes are going to create great value in our world, and it's up to us to figure out and collab collaboratively how we use those together to create real value. And your third question was? Green yeah, green energy. So um, I think of it really broad. I think of it that if I help an automotive manufacturer lightweight their powertrain, then, then that's creating um, efficiency, energy efficiency. I'm a big believer in solar. I know it's been kind of troubled with all the things going on with the trade issues. Um, but for me, to think that crystal and silicon could go from five, six years ago being at a 12% efficiency to where it's 17, 18, 19% efficient now, um, and the other technologies that are there, um, I think it's going to be an important part of our future. Because I do think there are areas that are never, it's never going to be cost effective to put them on the grid. And so how do we then take those areas and, and give them the energy they need um, in a very distributed way it, it, that is cost effective. And I think the science continues to, to advance there. Um, and whether it's in solar or cellulose to fuels, or there's a lot of different ways that, that we can help that equation. And I, I just think we're in the very beginning of it, and it's going to be very exciting. I just want to add. Um on this solar issue, uh, Inner Research Institute in New York, there's been amazing work done on battery technology for storage of power. So decentralized power, uh, very suitable for our rural areas. And we've been having a lot of conversations with the research group there. And it seems uh, they've done path-breaking work, which I'm sure will help the U.S., but will also help us Absolutely. enormously. But using new types of battery which have been developed, and the automotive batteries which they developed are 50% of the weight of lead-acid batteries. Just, just to give one example of, of what's going on. Actually, there's a lot of innovation, a lot of research work going on in America on energy. Well, and just, it, just it, amazing. it needs to, right? I, and we've become much less dependent on imported oil yeah. as a country. Um, and we need to have options. And I think these investments in research and development and the innovation that's coming from it is going to give not only our country, but countries around the world real options in terms of playing out their energy yeah. future. Nikhil? Uh, 
Patel, uh, reliance is associated with the bond over its entire journey in the energy field. It's uh, been a journey of over 35 years, and we feel emotionally connected to the bond, and I want to not only congratulate, but also commemorate El Elaine and the whole company on nursing this relationship, and we always look forward for newer and better ideas. So on my behalf and on behalf of all of us, India, uh, your visit to India always is very inspirational. Having said that, uh, if you look at mid-90s, uh, DuPont was, uh, was a petroleum, chemicals, and a textile fibers company. Uh, I think revenue of about $43 billion. And if we look at DuPont today, it is advanced materials, agriculture, biosciences company, as majority of the businesses, with revenue roughly 38 or 39 billion, which is almost the same. Uh, we in chemical industry talk about innovation, and this would not have been possible without a very strong, sustained focus on innovation because it is a path where you can have many failures, but as long as you have the courage to get up and continue to improve, it would not have happened. And that has led to successes of several brands that you continue to enjoy and nurse. Uh, I would, uh, my question in that respect is, what has it taken in terms of the patience and the leadership to drive that path of innovation? It will be very, very uh, informative and useful to all of us in India. Oh, thank you very much for your compliment. I, um, you know, we, we're firm believers that um, value goes down, not up, without innovation. And if we're going to be valued as a company in the future, um, we just can't give our customers the same that we gave them last year or five years ago. There has to be more value. So that takes innovation. And, um, and even if it's just every year incrementally gaining another 3 to 5% on yield in a farmer's field, I mean, that's worth something. Um, or it's a breakthrough like we had in um, rena in an insecticide, Renaxapur, that has very low toxicity, very human friendly. You use it in ounces, not tank cars full. And, um, and that's a, a step change, but it takes all of it, right? And we measure that. We measure in, for every business, um, new products as a percent of their sales, that new products introduced in the last four years. Um, and that's a measure of how they're focused on innovation. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a corporation has to look at it and say, you know, we're not an energy company. Conoco, we owned Conoco back in the 90s, um, an oil company. Um, and that, that was something that was done in a, decades before as a hedge against, uh, you know, energy costs. And innovation couldn't help it. And so it we spun it out on its own. And areas where innovation can't create that real value, there's, there's probably a lower cost model than DuPont to really go after it. So we're focused on areas where there's growth through utilizing science and innovation to really help our customers succeed. And I'd like to think of that portfolio change as natural because the science really has led us there. And then we've had to take some, t you know, decisions to buy things or sell things in order to get it done. But if you look at the 210 years of DuPont, you can follow a thread in science, from explosives through nitrocellulose, through cellulose into polymers, and all the way through. And, um, and that's why no matter global financial crisis or not, we never cut our R&D budget. Uh, we looked at all the projects and said, do they all make sense? Is there going to be you know, is, it, is that product or that innovation going to be relevant coming out of the global financial crisis? But, the, you know, the fact that we opened the, you know, Hyderabad Center right in the middle of it. You know, we're, we're committed to the innovation side. It all doesn't work out. We're not perfect by any stretch of the imaginations. I have a philosophy that says that we should learn more from our failures than we learn from our successes. You know, otherwise, we're doomed to repeat them. And, and I make us do root cause analysis. I'll sit in the room. It's uncomfortable, but it's not about, I mean, I, you know, I keep saying I've made a lot of mistakes in my career, and it's only because I learned from them that I became a stronger leader. And we, to be a stronger science company, we have to learn from that. 
So I'm, you know, I'm really excited about the future, adding things like nanotechnology or biotechnology to chemistry. It's not that, the, you know, uh, the chemists will be here. We're still hiring chemists and chemical engineers. Um, but they have to be able to work with, you know, material scientists and, and biotechnologists in order to really create the innovation. And I think it's a really exciting time, but it's one that you have to work at constantly because the need to do that just never goes away. I want to open it out to anybody. Madhur, you've been, okay, you've been putting your hand up. I think I notice you now. Mr. Madhur Bajaj, Vice Chairman of Bajaj Auto. Thank you, Darren. Good evening, ma'am. You are steering a company which is over 200 years old. Our group has got 50-year-old, even 100-year-old companies, but not 200 years. <clears throat> I see three scenarios. When you have a company which is sustained so well for so long, you have a lot of luggage, which can be a drag. That's one scenario. It's not a positive scenario, but scenario. Second is, yes, the fact that it has sustained for so long, that means it has matured. It has done a lot of things right from which it can learn, as you mentioned. And the third scenario is, the innovation and transformation which has made the company anew. So it's like a startup company, if I may use a loose term. Where do you see DuPont and where would you like to lead it? Is it a combination of all three or is it one of the three? You know, it's, it's a really interesting question. You know, because we were made up of 12 businesses, each in unique market areas and unique set of capabilities. And the first question I ask the business leader when they come in for their strategy review, we do strategy reviews if not every year, every other year, or third year, depending on how well they're doing. The better you do, the less often you have to come in. So that's, they like that. Um, and I say, how do you define your business? How do you define yourself? And I find that those that define themselves by what they have or by the past, there's a correlation between that and their results. Those that define themselves incrementally forward, and then there are those that define themselves 10 years out without necessarily the whole path to get there, but that have a vision. And you have, you have to have that vision, right? And it's not that you'll necessarily end up there because you'll learn things along the way that may help you modify your journey. But if you think about it from who you are today, you're always going to limit who you'll be. But if you think about what you want to be, and you have to be realistic, because you know, I'm very clear that there has to be a right for DuPont to win if we go into a space. What's our right to win? Why should the industry use us as opposed to the incumbents? Um, and we sh there needs to be differentiation. But I, I find it really does. I try to define the company and where it's going um, with the reality of where we are. And then definitive steps on, you know, what do we need to get done in 2013? You know, what do we need to get done in 2014 to continue it? And, you know, I've probably changed my 2015 plan three times since I started this role in 2009 because the world's changed, right? And so you, you just can't get too wedded to it. You've got to have that flexibility. And you have to have the planning processes that can, um, can go with that, right? That can move with the changes in the marketplace. But I mean, try that sometime with one of your young up and coming um, hotshot business people. How do you define what it is? And it, it, it leads you to a dialogue that's developmental for both of us. I've learned a lot from those discussions. Um, but that also gets people thinking that incremental is not enough. It may be all you can eke out in a year given economics, uh, you know, the economic environment or what a competitor does because he comes in with something novel that surprises you. But if that's all it ever is, right, then you've resigned yourself to mediocrity. And I think that's why you have to continue to keep that bar moving out. How do you keep in touch with your people? Are you communicating them? Are you talking to them? Are you writing to them? What is the, what's the system and how often are you communicating? Your, your, 
you're traveling all the time, you've got so many businesses, you've got your board, you know, you've got a huge structure. It's a there. challenge. So it's a challenge. What, how do you deal with the challenge of communication with people? I find I'm more effective um, in person or verbally right. than I am by writing things down. I find that writing things down, there's a lot of, not that we don't write things down, we do, but there's a lot of room for misinterpretation or interpretation to what their comfort level is. But if I go eyeball to eyeball to Rajiv about the goals in India for 2015, um, he can't wiggle away or he can't say to me then, if that's what you expect, this is what I need. You know, I think you have to have that. That's why we all travel so much, right? Um, but it is a challenge because I think that personal um, interaction and that relationship um, creates a bond about the future um, and a common goal um, that, that, that we know we're not alone. Rajiv isn't alone in his quest to grow India. He's got lots of help, right? Whether it's Homi in the technology side or his team in each of the businesses or, you know, or me coming in or others that are other leadership coming in to help. You know how much help we give, right? Um, but, you know, I always say, well, what do you need? I mean, let's talk about, and it's not about just throwing money at it. There has to be a return for that. And how are we developing our people? And how are we making sure we have the right skill set inside? So I do think it's, it's a lot of personal energy that has to go into it if you're going to make it stick. Uh, Sorry, just a follow-up question, Tarun, if you don't mind. Uh, Tarun mentioned about communication. Especially, and I can understand the flexibility because the world is changing and you have to be flexible. How do you communicate this to 70,000 people? Because if you do not communicate well, there will be a lot of confusion, I guess. So we've, um, during the global financial crisis, in 2000, when we were starting 2009, the one thing I found coming through the end of 08 was people were hiding in their offices and were afraid to come out because they were afraid they'd get tapped on the shoulder to be laid off, because we were doing layoffs then in, in some of our businesses, because volumes were heavily off. Uh, but more importantly, they were doing that because they were scared about what they should do, what could they do to make a difference. The world was just not a happy place. And every time they called the customers, the customers would just cancel more orders. So they didn't want to call on customers because that was a negative reinforcement. So um, in order to get people out from underneath their desks, as I used to call it, or out of their offices, um, we created a set of directives. Because I really felt that if, if, if we couldn't impact the global economy, but I could impact what 70,000 people got up and did every day. And so we wanted to get aligned around the goals for 2009. So we had our, um, our directives, which talked about productivity. We could, we could impact what we spent, capital, cost. We could impact the cash we generated, and we really needed to generate cash because we, there was a lot of uncertainty about access into the commercial paper markets back then, and, and we have an ag business, so cash flows are lumpy, and, um, and I want to pay my dividend to my shareholders because I want them to know that even through the darkest periods, I value them, and I'd like them to value me and stay with us, right? And so it was really important to be able to pay the dividend. A lot of companies cut their dividend or eliminated it during that period. By the way, not many of them thanked me for that, and I do point that out to them when I visit them. Um, they asked me when I'm going to raise it. I said, remember, I never cut it. But, um, so I, we wrote these directives on what we want to do with customer engagement, cost, new product introduction, research and development, productivity, cash generation. And then I talked about behaviors on the bottom, transparency, accountability, speed and agility, right, and collaboration. Because I really felt that if we behaved in a way, engaged our customers, and made and talked about the future with new products, innovation, in a way that positioned us better than the next guy, that we'd come out of the financial crisis better than the competition. And that was the goal. And it really helped. And so we repeated it again, and we repeated it again. And then what I found is that when I come into India, there's the format for the directives. But instead of the goals for the company, there's the goals for India around revenue, core values, revenue, energy efficiency, or, um, productivity, around uh, people, 
you know, what are, what are, how does what India does in 2013 help the company make their goals? And their specific what's and their specific how's and metrics associated with it. And I see it when I visit Rajiv, I see it when I visit a business leader or a research center. So we use that as an alignment process about what progress we need to make relatively short term in the next year. Um, and I really think that, you know, for 70,000 people see that. And if I can get 70,000 people to see themselves in it, what can I do as an individual when I get up every day to go to work to help make this company stronger, then we got a great shot at making those goals. Because it is about people at the end of the day and engagement. And it is about having them come to work, not saying, well, here I go again, but saying, well, what can I get done today? Can I get that project finished today? Um, can I engage that customer about this or get the product out the door from the plant? So, I mean, so how do I get that momentum, excitement, real spirit, as, as it were? Um, and it's a hard thing to do, and believe me, we're not cooked, but we work at it hard. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm uh, Gautam Trivedi from Religar. I have two questions that are not sort of uh, related. The first one is, uh, how do you manage as a CEO the uh, uh, expectations of Wall Street versus running a real company? And the second question is, uh, are carbon fibers for mass automotive applications a reality in the next five to seven years, given uh, costs are coming up? So I can, I can answer the first one better than the second one. But the first one is, how do you manage Wall Street expectations? And, and what was the second, in light of? Yeah, well, I guess the question is, uh, how are you managing Wall Street expectations in light of running a real company? Yeah. So that it's, um, you spend way too much time on that. I spend way too much time on that, because uh, I have to. So we give annual guidance. And I wish we gave no guidance at all, but we, you know, the, if you don't give guidance, they'll make it up themselves, and then you know, you're spending all your time talking away from it. Um, but I spend time talking about our strategy. So as, as Nikhil pointed out, we're a different company now than we were in the 1990s. Very different set of businesses, very different set of growth and potential. And yet when I go in and talk to some analysts, they still think of us as having a large part of commodity chemicals business, which we have some, but they're a much smaller part of the company. So we've been spending a lot of time <coughs> making sure that they know who we are. But it is time consuming. But at the end of the day, they have to be able to value us well. And they have to be able to talk about why it would be in their investors' best interest to invest in a DuPont versus another company. So we have a, a great IR team, and they work it. And I do spend time. Uh, every quarter out, um, as I say, selling stock. Um, but doing it in a way that really gives them the long-term perspective of the company. Because it's not, it is about this quarter with them, but it's not about this quarter. They, they, this quarter is just a down payment. They want to know where you're going. <coughs> and they want to know that, it's, that, um, that where you're going is a place that they believe can generate real value. So I think your second question was about carbon fiber and automotive applications. So there's a, um, a lot of people working on it, or, a few, or about three, um, that I know of, and then a lot of little companies. I think, uh, I think the um, costs are still pretty high. Um, I think that to get it to scale and to get it at a time frame, meaning how long it takes you to make a part, is the holy grail. And I think, you know, I think it's hard to predict. I think there are other areas, like aerospace, that have a higher uh, that, uh, dollar per component just because of the nature of the industry. It'll probably, you know, obviously you've seen carbon fibers on the skins of the, the, the Boeing uh, Dreamliner, its battery problems notwithstanding. Um, but I think that automotive is where huge volume could be. Um, there's nowhere near the capacity in the industry to support it at nowhere near the cost it needs to be supported. Um, and I'm believing that down the road it's probably going to be composites of materials, combinations of materials that will probably enable from then a cost and productivity standpoint you to get there. But I think that's a hard one to predict um, on a year basis. Now, I, if you ask Torre or Tejan or people like that, they could, they'd give you their answer. But um, we'll see. Navneet Munod from State Bank of India Mutual Fund. My question is there have been expectations that US is regaining the manufacturing competitiveness 
thanks to the shale gas boom, the fall in wages in real terms while the cost structures are going up in, in other places on a relative basis, for example, places like China. What are your views on that as a large manufacturing group and what implications it can have? The another is, in your recent results, I saw that I think Latin America is a place where you seem to be doing quite well on a relative basis. What are those sectors or those places where you're looking for those growth? Yeah, so the first question is around um, the United States and manufacturing capability given the shale gas and the low cost inputs that that would provide and how does that weigh on our thinking about how we uh, look at capacity and, and things like that going forward. I think I've paraphrased that. Um, and, you know, so when we look at siting a plant site, we look at a lot of different things. Can we protect our intellectual property? Is there a good workforce that's, that's uh, capable of performing the task in a very um, disciplined way? Um, what's the tax regime, right? Is there a certainty? Or, and taxes can, can really play havoc with, uh, with where you manufacture. Um, and input costs. So shale gas is supposed to be, we're, we're not as natural gas dependent as others because we're not in the basics, but natural gas does have an impact. Uh, but for us, it is not going to be the determinant of whether we put a plant in the United States or in India or in China. Um, it, it may be one of 15 factors that we use. Because you've got to consider transportation costs, you've got to consider the value chain, you know, how much inventory do we really want to carry, and um, you know, if you move manufacturing closer to where the market is, it has advantages. And so there's a lot of things that come into play. I know there are companies that are out there actively touting um, it as the miracle of renaissance, renaissance for the American manufacturing um, industry. Um, we tend to be more advanced manufacturing. So labor costs aren't as big a part for us. And I think it's going to take a while. I think it's going to be a positive, don't get me wrong. But I think it's going to take a while for them to develop it, capture it, and figure out what they're going to do with it. Um, and so I do think that's a, um, you know, it's, it's an element. But I don't think it's going to massively swing uh, in a very short period of time what happens. Um, your second question was about, oh, Latin America and that. So we've had a great run in Latin America. Coming off of um, agriculture, uh, tremendously driven by agriculture. So um, we've always been down there in the automotive industry and a local player and those types of things. But with the biggest change in the last five years has been our investment in seed conditioning and research centers for seed. So corn and soy, and they're big soy. Um, and I'm, I'm, you're, I'm amazed, I don't have the numbers with me, of how large corn and soy is. Because when everybody thinks about Brazil, they think sugar cane. But there's just, if you, around Brasilia, there's just huge swatches of, of corn and soy. Um, and, and where technology has had an impact. And, um, you know, localized germplasm, hybridization, um, and traits, <coughs> you know, in combination, taking it from a very fragmented agricultural industry to a very large, mechanized, uh, well-developed agriculture industry. And I think we've, we've been a beneficiary of the investments that we've made there. And it's, it's really uh, given us great growth as a company. Investment in agriculture in India? We do. We are. You're doing? We are. We're Subaru. Is he still here? So um, we have, um, uh, from a research and um, center standpoint and localization of the germplasm and building, you know, building out the seed corn here, um, we do our rice hybridization research in Hyderabad. And I know rice hybridization isn't necessarily a uh, large component of the rice industry, but there are ways that we can maybe make it uh, um, uh, a more resilient right, from a milling standpoint and things like that that could help that. So we think that India has tremendous opportunity in agriculture. I was amazed at the differences I saw just in the, outside of Amritsar in the Punjab region of, of large farmers by Indian standards, uh, 40, 60 hectares, um, modern techniques, um, great yields, and then five kilometers down the road, tiny farmers, 
And then two kilometers down the road, a dairy industry, you know, where it, it, they need all the, not only the seeds to grow the corn, but the inoculants for the silage. And I just think there's tremendous opportunity and a great, you know, we're investing a lot locally in education, educating farmers um, in, in modern agronomy and bringing the, the techniques on the management of the season um, that can have as big an impact on their results as can the science of the seed or the crop protection chemicals. So I think there's a lot of opportunity um, in India and in agriculture, and we're making the investments. Great. Suresh, the former cabinet minister, you have a question? Well, now he does. I'm not sure he had one before, but you're tough. Well, no, he told me he had a question. Okay, okay. And so we had a... I thought he was we, just being we, mean. We, we had a powwow earlier in the day. Sorry to have missed some of your interesting comments, but just uh, in case I'm not repeating something which already has been said, how do you look at uh, now in the next 10 years, where would China be moving, where the India would be moving, because you are a global company looking at all these, both the markets from a different perspective. Where do you think uh, India will be going? And now, nowadays people are talking about new players joining BRICS, not necessarily maybe Indonesia, Somebody's talking about Philippines could also be big players. So how do you look at Asia and which are the main players in Asia which you think in the next 10, 15 years would really emerge? Yeah, so I wish I had a crystal ball. <laughs> because um, every time I think things are going in a straight line, something happens, right? I mean, you know, we talk about the devaluation here in India of your currency and some hesitation around investment. Um, China has been no happy place in 2012. Very bumpy road. Um, great in agriculture. Well, so was India. Um, you know, good in food ingredients. Yeah, so was India. Um, infrastructure investment was well off. And, um, and there was no straight line. I know they say that the, that the country grew, you know, 7%. Um, but if you were in the industrial side of the world, it didn't feel that way at all. Um, and so they had their transition of leadership, which will continue. And when I guess all the provincial and the ministers change over in March, they're all off now because it's Lunar New Year, and that's their biggest holiday season. Um, and so I'm not sure we'll know about what happens in 13 in China until going into the second quarter. But if you think about a planned economy, they seem to be able to turn a knob and make things happen when they want to. And they've got big challenges. Um, they have uh, massive defections from the rural areas into urban areas and the impacts that that has on their infrastructure, on water, on energy. Uh, at the same time, you've got a fragmented farming community and you've got nobody necessarily wanting to be farmers because they are still phenomenally fragmented and they're just starting down the path of trying to figure out how you, they create a production system in farming um, that's consistent with their country's size and needs. And um, so they've got, they've got some big issues. Uh, they want to grow their own industries. Um, they have a um, occurring and need to continue to occur. Um, you've got tremendous power in a growing middle class or from, a, from an internal growth standpoint. Um, that you can build uh, out your economy just on your own um, consumption, you know, relative to that for a while, right? Tremendous opportunity. And so the challenge for democracies, mine included, is will our governments help us create economic growth? Um, and so I think that creates a huge opportunity and a huge challenge. I mean, we're having our own challenge in the United States. Don't get me wrong, it's not easy. Because we've got a deficit that's gonna choke a horse and we gotta get that down to create the certainty to have consistent economic growth. And, um, and I, I'm not, you know, some days I'm very optimistic about it and other days I just, you know, go back to Wilmington and go to my day job and am and, and thankful that I, I run a company like DuPont and I can go to places around the world and see how our science makes a difference. You know, Indonesia, ASEAN, huge population, you know, behind where, you know, and need to catch up. 
I just think of it all as opportunity. But it comes down to the basics. It comes down to population growth is putting pressure on our world. And a lot of that pressure is kind of come in India and ASEAN and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and it's, it's creating opportunities, whether it's in agriculture or whether it's in energy. Because all those people are going to want energy for their homes, for transportation, for communication or for protecting people in the environment because the world's not yeah. getting any bigger and there's going to be a lot more of us on there. And I think the areas where the population growth is going to be the largest are going to be the areas where there's the largest opportunity to really have science make a difference. Um, and so that's why it's really important for us to continue to build out on a local level our capability from um, science, application development, and technical science. One last question, gentlemen at the back. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Vish Palakar from Mahindra. My question is, uh, we've been talking a lot about India and the markets in Asia because of the growth that uh, in the recent past, these markets have been growing and the Western markets perhaps have been growing less. But with all this growth in India, we've got a lot of Indian companies now that have as global aspirations of their own. So I'd be very interested in your thoughts. For a minute, if you place yourself as a CEO of an Indian company, with a challenge to want to expand in the West, perhaps in other markets, uh, what would be two or three things that you would ask your team to focus on in, in the context of innovation or growth? Yeah, you know, I think that depending on the sector, what you really have to do is take a look at the competitive landscape region by region. And so each region has a series of companies that compete for the share of mind of their value chains, right? So what can I bring as an as a Indian manufacturer of whatever, right? What is my capability that will be relevant in that market? Because if you've got really strongly entrenched competition who are operating at the top of a pyramid, it's a top of a pyramid market, and our strength is in more in a distributed, um, you know, medium, um, you know, from that standpoint, then I'm not sure how my model's going to win there. So you really have to be very clear about how your model is relevant to that new market. And if it's not totally relevant, how can you change it to be relevant? You know, in some markets you have to go up, in others you have to go down, right? Because that's what the market will bear. And so it really is having that insight into that marketplace, the competitive dynamic, um, and what it's going to take to win. And then I, I'd ask myself what I ask myself every day, what's, what's our right to win there? What do we have that that marketplace values and would want to do business with us versus who they're presently doing business with or the like? And that's where the innovation side comes in because when I ask myself that question about DuPont, the answer many times comes back to the science, the innovation. Um, what can we do differentially? You know, in agriculture, can we bring um, education uh, because we're direct to the farmer and have um, those connections that many of my competitors can't bring? And so, I mean, I think that the, the, the world's an interesting place in that um, I know that if I were sitting here a year from now and we were discussing 2013, what I would tell you happened is different than what I think is going to happen now. In, most of my businesses or in the economy or whatever. And that's what makes it fun because it's a, it's a journey of learning and a journey of, of experimentation um, and learning from what you don't do right, quite right, and really doubling down on, uh, on what works for you. And I, I, that's why I love business. That's why I am, uh, you know, I, I think I've got the best job in the world, and, um, and I just am really proud to, to be part of this uh, DuPont company. You've given us an amazing insight into yourself as a CEO, the chair of DuPont, as a leader. What about your family? I do have one. You have one. I have one. What do the kids think of, what do your children think of you as a CEO? How do you combine this hugely challenging job of leading DuPont with managing the other part, being a wife, being a mother? Yeah, so I, I have to uh, give, uh, give us an insight into So full transparency, I have three children <laughs> and a husband. Um, I have, my, my daughter is 22, graduated from college, working for General Electric in communications in New York. 
Uh, my sons are 18, they're twins, and they're first year freshmen at the University of Virginia in engineering. And we, we're hoping the engineering sticks because we think uh, the, that, uh, well, I'm an engineer, my husband's an engineer as well. So, you know, I've always, I grew up in a house where my mom worked. So for me, it, it was just a normal course. And my kids grew up in a house where their mom worked. Um, but I don't think they really got what I did. And, you know, they just said, yeah, yeah, you work for DuPont. You're one of 70,000 people that work for DuPont, yeah. Um, I don't think they really got what I did until I became CEO. And um, I don't think I understood how proud they were of me until I became CEO, because actually that's when they told me. Um, because, you know, your kids, they always think, I, you know, they, they tell you you're lame. You know, that's an American term that teenagers use, um, which is not a, uh, a positive attribute. Um, <laughs> You know, all through their all through their middle school and, and you know high school years. You know, your parents are you know we're dumb, we don't get it, um, and you know it was kind of cool that my kids actually thought it was neat what I did. They're um, they're learning about the world in a different way because I drag them around the world. Right, one of them is just not a traveler, and it doesn't matter. He's coming with us, and he would rather sit home. He's my homebody. And the other two, are wand they'll wander anywhere in the world. Um, but I want to show them a world outside of Wilmington, Delaware. Wilmington, Delaware is a small place and relatively insular. And uh, to be successful in the world, they've got to figure out how to operate in a much broader environment than Wilmington, Delaware. And I think that's, that's one of the advantages. And I do think that at least two out of three really appreciate that point. Um, but and I'm working on the third. And uh, we'll see how that goes. There, I, you know, I tell you, that's my sanity, is my family. I, um, I can shut out the world and uh, focus on them. And when they're little, you have to, because they demand your physical presence. And when they're older, you have to, because you've got to keep them out of trouble, which teenagers inevitably go, go towards like a moth to a flame. But, um, but I have a lot of fun with that. And um, thank you for asking. Thank you for answering. You know, I was, um, as we close this conversation with you, and I was listening to you for the last hour, and I've been thinking of uh, how do I describe you at the end? You're quite amazing. Mm -hmm. You're amazing. Quite ordinary. No, you're quite amazing. And uh, you know why? Several reasons. Your enormous capability comes out. And I, I think. Everybody here would feel that enormous capability comes out in the way you have responded. You're, you're, you're deeply thoughtful. I've dealt with CEOs all my life. You're deeply thoughtful and so much more thoughtful than so many people that one has seen. So that's, that's huge for a company to have a CEO who's so deeply thoughtful. You're straight. You are what you are. Mm -hmm. And we got that, you know, in the way you talked to us and you responded to questions. You are straight. Rajiv knows where he is with you, you know. He stands with And I come see him so I know where <laughs> yeah, I am yeah. with him and he knows where he is with me. But the most important thing for me, maybe I'm out of line, maybe I'm old-fashioned. I will definitely follow you down those steps because yeah, you, you know, better next you know, time, I'm, or I'm going to be I, I'm, I'm going to be writing you up. Yeah, give you a citation. You know that the most important thing for me is your seventy thousand people, and I think the people in this room, people, people like me who are meeting you for the first time, we, we trust you. You know that's so important because if you are someone who people can trust, then they will, they will go with you. They I will give their lives for you. And I think that, for me, is, is a huge thing. Because everything that you've said, the way you've said it, your directness, your straightforwardness, your sincerity, your seriousness, we trust you. Well, you're very kind. What, what, what's, you know? So let's give her a really big hand. Ellen Fulman. <laughs> terrific. terrific. really thinking about what, what to say. Yeah. And let's, let's come from the heart. Thank you. You're great. Um, okay. you
first, and I'm going to watch you. <laughs> at, at 74, I get...